Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a GP talking to a patient called George Babsy. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mr. Babsby. I was surprised to see your name on the list of my appointments today, considering you were just in for your annual checkup last month, which showed you to be a fit fifty-five-year-old man. What seems to be the problem? Oh, it's absolutely awful. I was putting some tools away in the shed in the back garden, and then all of a sudden, this very severe sharp pain started. I wanted to wait a bit and see if it would subside, but it has been over two hours, and I'm still in considerable pain. At one point, it was so severe that I was nauseated and threw up two times. Oh my!、Uh, show me where the pain started. Well, it started just beneath my rib cage, but it seemed to go through towards my back. I see. Have you noticed any change in the severity of the pain when you stand or sit?、Uh, yes, a bit.、Uh, when I sit forward, the pain eases a bit.、Um, let me think a minute. You do not drink alcohol. No. I see you are a non-smoker as well, and you are not currently on any medication. Are you, Mr. Babsby?、Uh, no, not at the moment. I used to take medicine occasionally due to my migraines, but not at the moment. According to your recent checkup, your BMI was 22 kilograms per meter squared, which is within the normal range. And in general, your labs show you to be in great health. However, according to my examination just now. Your pulse is a bit elevated, and I can see that your epigastrium is very tender. So, what could be causing this sudden and considerable pain in your epigastrium? Do you think it could be something I ate, or I knew I shouldn't have eaten that fish and chips last night? No, that is not consistent with your symptoms. Well, it appears I'm going to need to get you admitted to hospital. Oh, I was afraid that you might say that I needed to go to the hospital. What will they do to me there? Surgery? You will need an ultrasound and a CT of your abdomen, as well as some other tests to get to the bottom of this. What do you think it could be? It could be a number of things. For instance, it could be acute pancreatitis, which is an acute inflammation of the pancreas, often caused by gallstones. Patients often present with severe onset abdominal pain associated with vomiting, and many report the pain to be radiating to the back. That matches your description, but there are other possibilities because one of the risk factors is being a heavy drinker, a factor in gallstones. But you don't fit that description. Oh no! A few of my uncles had gallstones. It seemed to be quite painful. What is the treatment for acute pancreatitis? The incidence of acute pancreatitis is rising in the UK, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Like I said before, it could be a number of different things. And we just won't know what it is until the results come back. Well, let's get you to the hospital. One of the important tests you need done to make a diagnosis will check your level of pancreatic enzymes. It's good that you came in right away because these tests are more accurate the closer they are done to the onset of the pain. Oh, doc, there was no way I could wait any longer. I called as soon as your office opened. I'm glad you did that. Now. Extract two.
Questions 13 to 24. You hear an optometrist talking to a patient called Austin Jacobs. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, come on in. You are Mr. Jacobs, correct? That's right, uh, Austin Jacobs. So I can read here in the file and see for myself that both your left and right eye are irritated. Can you tell me when this started? Yeah, um, the left eye became irritated and itchy about four days ago, and then the right eye followed a day later. I see. Have you noticed uh, any discharge or anything else other than the general itchiness? Yes, there has been some yellow discharge coming from both eyes. Yesterday morning it was a bit difficult to open my eyes in the morning, and I have noticed that there is this crusted, dry, flaky material on my eyelashes. Uh, I see. Have you felt anything in the eye, like a foreign body? Has your vision been negatively affected? No, nothing in my eye. I tried to take a look and couldn't see anything uh, foreign in there. Just a little redness and uh, no, no decreased vision. I see here in the medical history you filled out that there's no family history of glaucoma or any related diseases. So what about medication? Are you currently using any eye drops? Do you use contact lenses? Mm, no, to both questions. This is the first time I can remember having any issues with my eyes. I generally try to take care of my vision, wear sunglasses, and take breaks from all the screens in my life. Very good. Okay. Your symptoms are consistent with active conjunctivitis of both eyes. There are several types of conjunctivitis, such as viral, allergic, atopic, bacterial, medication, and exposure. Because the redness and discharge is not severe, and based on your medical history, yours is probably viral. What is that exactly? Some sort of virus got into my eyes? Yes, exactly. Viral conjunctivitis is an inflammatory response to infection of the tissues surrounding the eye and eyelid by a virus. The most common cause is adenovirus, which can also cause upper respiratory infection. Hmm, I was playing video games with my neighbour the other day. He has been sick for the past week or so. Could that be the cause of my problem? A very likely culprit. Now, for most patients, viral conjunctivitis clears up on its own in about two weeks, so no medication needed at this time. So, no prescription or anything? It will just go away? Yes, that is correct. We only prescribe antibiotics if a bacterial etiology is suspected, but that is not the case here since your case is quite mild. Bacterial conjunctivitis usually presents with severe redness and thick, milky discharge. In the meantime, I'm going to recommend that you buy a bottle of artificial tears, which you can get over the counter. Artificial tears are eye drops used to lubricate dry eyes and help maintain moisture on the outer surface of your eyes. I also recommend applying cool compresses. Uh, okay, how do I do that? Is that something I have to buy? Oh, no. Um, for a cool compress, just take a clean cloth and soak it in cool water. Then you just need to wring it out and apply it to your eyes. Now it is important that you do not rub your eyes with the cold compress. It will just make the irritation and itchiness worse. Finally, you should make sure to be extra diligent about hand washing and other disinfectant techniques to prevent transmission. So make sure you change your pillowcases and towels. You don't want any other friends or family members to become infected. Okay, uh, no problem. Yeah, my parents are coming for a visit in a week and I definitely don't want them to get this. Definitely not. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, 
you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a patient expressing a concern to an occupational therapist. Now read the question. So today we're going to conduct an occupational therapy assessment to see what your needs are. I can see that you have progressed to fully weight-bearing and that you are using a walking stick. Yes, it has been a long journey since my accident. I have started to use the stairs by relying on one handrail and my walking stick. What are your main concerns now, Sheila? I really want to be able to get into a bath to shower. I have tried, but stepping into the shower is very painful. Also, I'm not able to use my right arm to reach out and support myself when getting into the bath. Pain in my leg and the problem with my right arm makes me nervous about showering. Question 26. You hear two radiologists discussing the possible diagnosis of a patient. Now read the question. I have a case of a 53-year-old female complaining of a sore throat, difficulty swallowing and the sensation of a lump underneath her tongue. She was referred to me by her GP as it appears that the symptoms have been worsening over the past few months. I ordered a CT as plain radiographs showed nothing. Let's take a look at the scans. Oh, that's interesting. Do you see that? There appears to be a bony outgrowth arising from the base of the temporal bone of the skull. That could definitely be the cause of the symptoms of this patient. Have you ever seen a case of Eagle Syndrome? Hmm, I think when I was an intern. Question 27. You hear a morning briefing in a ward. Now read the question. Now we come to Mr. Jenkins, who came into the psychiatry A&E department last night. Cheryl, can you present the case, please? Of course, Dr. Scott. The patient is a 40-year-old man who presented with inappropriate behaviour and confusion. According to his records, he has appeared fidgety for several years. A neuro consult found him to be alert, but easily distracted. He also had problems spelling world backwards but demonstrated no short-term memory problems. With ambulation, jerky movements are present in the hand and his balance is altered. A urine drug screen came back negative. There seems to be a lot we don't know about the patient. Cheryl, please get a full medical history on this man as well as his family. Then, depending on what we find out, we can move on to tests now. Question 28. You hear an intern asking a senior doctor about the diagnosis of a patient. Now read the question. Dr Norris, I have a question about the patient with the long-term ongoing tremor. Shouldn't we be considering Parkinson's disease as a possible diagnosis? Yes, it is a consideration, but there are a few symptoms you should look closely at to differentiate between the two diagnoses. For example, the patient has been experiencing a hand tremor for quite a while, but he also has a head tremor. Also, the overall health of the patient is good. Patients with Parkinson's disease often have other problems. Do you know what those are? Oh, yes. 
stooped posture, slow movement, memory loss. Thank you for helping me to look more closely at the symptoms. Question 29. You hear a dermatologist in a training session with an intern. Now read the question. So, Sarah, what do you know about your patient? Patient is a 67-year-old man presenting with two nodules on his left elbow. He has no history of skin conditions, but was diagnosed two years ago with rheumatoid arthritis, which he manages with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. The nodules are uncomfortable and aesthetically displeasing, but they're not causing the patient any pain. What do you recommend as the next step? During my examination, I noticed two large, firm, skin-coloured, subcutaneous nodules. I recommend performing a biopsy to check for rheumatoid nodules. Question 30. You hear an A&E doctor briefing a colleague about a patient. Now read the question. Mrs. Mason, a 32-year-old woman, came into the A&D last night for a mildly itchy rash on both legs that had been ongoing for three days as well as lower extremity joint pain and abdominal pain. She informed me that she has had a winter cold for about one week and has been taking over-the-counter cough medication for her symptoms. She told me that she suspected that the rash may be the result of an allergic reaction to the cough medication but that the rash worsened after she stopped taking the medication. She said she has not had fever, diarrhea, vomiting or other symptoms. Lab results and a chest radiography are normal. I'm going to call for a dermatology consult. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, You'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear a dermatologist, Derek Evans, give a presentation about the challenges facing his speciality. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, welcome everyone, fellow dermatologists and interested health professionals. I want to start off by thanking all of you for taking the time to attend this session. 
I'm honoured by your presence and I genuinely hope you walk away from it energised and armed with information to take action. As we all know so well, dermatologists are currently facing a series of unprecedented challenges that pose a real threat to patient access to high quality dermatologic care due to the mounting difficulties facing those of us in private practice. More and more of our patients are being forced to pay out of pocket to seek out our services, which limits their ability to continue to see a dermatologist and to receive appropriate medical treatment and advice for their skin conditions. But even bigger challenges loom ahead for our speciality. Uh, we must all ask ourselves how dermatology will fit into the big picture as national healthcare priorities focus on large-scale public health issues such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity and depression. In this crowded field of overwhelming public health crises, we must make the case for dermatology. For example, we dermatologists play a critical role in reducing the burden of skin cancer, a cancer that will affect approximately two in three Australians before the age of 70, and that is the third most common cancer in the country. Research also shows that we often serve as a gateway for women's health. A recent survey reported that 88% of dermatologists have discovered internal disease in female patients through examinations of patients' hair, skin, nails and mucous membranes. But the unfortunate fact is that most policy makers do not really understand the critical services we provide. Furthermore, policy makers often don't even take our speciality into consideration because there are so few of us. In fact, fewer than 2% of doctors specialize in dermatology. That is why my first proposal is to work to increase the number of residency positions available to train new dermatologists. There are currently approximately 300 residency positions per year, a number which has remained fairly constant over the last decade, while at the same time the number of people in the country has grown quite rapidly. In order to increase the number of residency positions, we need to find a funding mechanism to financially support them. A related proposal is to increase the number of women in the dermatology workforce. As you've probably noticed, women make up an increasing percentage of medical students. For this reason, we need to focus on attracting women to the field of dermatology. This leads me to my second proposal, which is to work on correcting the perception of dermatology both in the medical community and outside of it. Dermatology has become a much more diverse speciality over the years. As I mentioned earlier, Policymakers generally don't have a thorough understanding of the work that dermatologists do. They still see us as the wart and acne doctors of the past or just expensive cosmeticians. We need to work to make the public and policymakers understand that issues like acne and rosacea are medical issues, so they will seek out appropriate medical treatment with a qualified dermatologist instead of turning to familiar drugstore products, such as baby oil or coconut oil. A result of the shortage of dermatologists caused in part by the reasons detailed above is that more and more physicians without speciality training are starting to practice dermatology. You often see doctors opening so-called skin disease treatment centers. Skin disease treatment centers to attract patients who are on long waiting lists to see their dermatologist. Having individuals treated by physicians without speciality training is not good for anyone involved, particularly the patients. We need to demonstrate to our fellow physicians that we are to be valued and recognized as key players on the local patient care team. One concrete way that we can help to correct the perception of our speciality is through getting more involved with research. When dermatologists turn away from research, it is pharmaceutical companies that step in to fill the void. Also, when we do choose to do research, we need to be careful about the funding source to make sure we are not doing the work of the previously mentioned pharmaceutical industry. The issue of industry-funded research 
is one that I will not get into at this time, but it is definitely worth more ex exploration. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear a presentation by a dietitian about a diet recommended for people with a certain gastrointestinal condition. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm going to talk about a current hot topic in the field of gastroenterology and nutrition using a low FODMAP diet to treat irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. IBS is a fairly common condition in Australia. According to the latest numbers, IBS develops in as many as one in five Australians or 20% of the population at some point in their lifetime. Looking outside of Australia, about 15% of the global population, or one in seven people worldwide, struggle with IBS. An interesting fact is that women are twice as likely to develop IBS as men. A bit of background on IBS before moving into the main topic of the day. IBS is a symptom-based gastrointestinal disorder for which there are no diagnostic tests. Instead, IBS is diagnosed after ruling out other digestive conditions, such as Crohn's disease and celiac disease. IBS is characterized by irregularities in bowel habits, such as diarrhea, constipation, or a combination of the two. The contradictory nature of symptoms, as well as their tendency to change over time, makes this a very difficult disease to manage. While the cause of IBS is still unknown, its development and flare-ups are thought to result from problems in the interaction between the gut, brain and nervous system. Many people who develop IBS do so during or after particularly stressful life events and experience flare-ups in the presence of strong emotions. IBS is unpredictable, making it difficult to manage for healthcare providers and their patients. This unpredictability, combined with the nature of the symptoms, means that IBS has the potential to interfere with many aspects of patients' lives and if left untreated, it can lead to unintentional weight loss, nutrient deficiencies and depression. Treatment for IBS can include medications such as antidiarrheal medicines, painkillers, constipation treatments, antispasmodics to treat the symptoms of the disease. But they don't get at the potential underlying causes of the problem. Another part of the treatment plan for IBS is a change in diet and lifestyle. This is where the low FODMAP diets come in. As previously mentioned, IBS is an unpredictable disease and presents differently in each patient, so a FODMAP diet may not be appropriate for all patients. Now, let's get into what the low FODMAP diet is all about. FODMAP stands for fermentable, obligo, di, and monosaccharides and polyols and excludes popular and flavorful ingredients like onions and garlic 
which can make sticking to a low FODMAP diet quite challenging for patients. This is where registered dietitians come in, as it is part of our job to make the low FODMAP diet sustainable for patients. We will get back to this later. Next, I want to give you a bit more information about the diet itself. The diet begins with an elimination period in which FODMAP containing foods are limited. FODMAPs are short chain carbohydrates, including lactose, fructose, fructans, fructans and galactans, found in some grains, fruit, vegetable, legumes and dairy products and are difficult for some people to digest and absorb. In addition to garlic and onion, other FODMAP containing foods are artichoke, asparagus, celery, kidney beans, pickled vegetables, cherries, pears and cashews. What happens is when FODMAPs reach the small intestine, they move slowly, attracting water, and then as they pass to the large intestine, FODMAPs are fermented by gut bacteria, producing excess gas. The extra water and gas causes the intestines to stretch the gut, which is particularly painful for people suffering from IBS, as they already have a highly sensitive gut. After an elimination period of four to six weeks, foods are gradually reintroduced to determine which foods trigger IBS symptoms. Once a patient's trigger foods have been identified, a dietitian can support the patient in developing a well-balanced eating plan whose objective is to manage future IBS symptoms. Research has shown a low FODMAP diet to be helpful for improving bloating, abdominal pain and flatulence among individuals with IBS. As I mentioned earlier, it won't work for all IBS patients, but it is certainly worth a try for those patients who haven't had success with other dietary changes. As you can imagine, following a low FODMAP diet, even for a short period of time, can be challenging, especially for patients who don't have the ability or time to cook their own meals from scratch. Fortunately, more and more companies have started to offer low FODMAP products that help people to follow the diet more easily.